Gotcha. Hey, how's it going everybody? It's the Game Economist, and today I'm going to teach you everything you need to know about invading. I'm going to give you some basic tips, and then we're going to get into really advanced stuff as well. So, this is kind of a, um, a wide topic. That's the best way to describe it. You could almost break it into categories. Uh, you know, there's the pre-game, right, before you invade. Then there's when you're invading, there's a lot of non-fighting things you need to be good at. And then finally, in the invasion, of course, you're going to reach a point where you're fighting the host and his friends. You really do need to be good at fighting at that point. So you could almost divide the whole thing into three parts. Pre-game, mid-game, late-game, right? Uh, I, that's kind of a simplified way to say all that. But let's start by talking about the pre-game. So, the first thing you need to do for the pregame is decide what level you want to invade at. The game is going to be pairing you against people who are about the same soul level as you. They'll actually pair you with people who are about 20 levels higher as well, and a little bit past that, okay? So if you want to do a twink build, twink builds are like, they're very low level builds, level 20, level 30, and you're there to harass a person who just got into the game, right? Usually, people who want to troll people usually do that, right? That's a twink build. Then you have a very common invasion range of like 60 to 90. These are going to be people who are trying to finish the campaign for the first time. And then what I do, I invade at the dual meta. Dual meta is uh, soul level 125. I run into plenty of people around the boss areas at that level. These are usually people who have already beaten the game one time, and they're, I would say, pretty competent. So those are going to be pretty difficult invasion levels. I would only recommend that if you're pretty comfortable with your PvP skills. Otherwise, probably the safest soul level to invade at is between 60 and 90. So you could be 90, you could be 60. You're going to be fighting people who are trying to beat the campaign for the first time, and you're going to get plenty of action. The next thing the game uses to decide how to pair you with people is how far you've upgraded your weapon. So this gets kind of tricky at this point. Basically, the game's not going to pair you with anyone who's upgraded their weapon much more than you, and vice versa. So if you've taken your weapon to like plus 10, you're only going to be invading people who have a weapon at about plus 10, maybe plus 9, maybe plus 8, but not really below that. So that's really important because as a player is progressing through the campaign, they might have their weapon at plus 5, they might have their weapon at plus 8, and you need to kind of match that. And there's actually a recommended table for this on the Dark Souls wiki. I'm going to link it in the description. I recommend you click on that. But generally, the whole idea here is think about how far the host would have upgraded their weapon at this point in the campaign, and that's what your weapon should be at, okay? So that's how you get into the invasions that you intend to get into, and that's a big part of the pregame. All right, the next thing we definitely need to talk about is your build. Your build has to be perfectly efficient, perfectly effective, and you need to be using a high-tier weapon. Okay, so this is where it gets kind of into an area where I can't just describe to you very quickly how to do this correctly. This is something where you kind of learn through experience, but I can give you pointers. I'm going to get us started by making sure that you know about a glitch called the Rosaria Respect Glitch. Basically, it's a glitch that allows you to build your character as many times as you want. Normally, there's a limit of respecting your character five times. Well, with this glitch, you can rebuild your character as many times as you want. And if you've never used the Rosaria Respect Glitch, it's very simple. You'll go up to Rosaria, respect your character like normal. Once the points have been uh, put into the attributes that you want, you'll you'll update your build, right? And then you, there'll be a moment where your character has been changed and you'll still be in the Rosaria menu. Well, you don't leave that menu. What you do is you actually shut the application down instead. You shut the game down. Uh, you don't log out of the game, you just shut it down. And then when you log back in, you haven't spent a Pale Tongue, but your build has been updated. That's the Rosaria Respect glitch, and I you know, I recommend that everybody knows how to do this glitch because it dramatically improves the uh, replayability of this game. So now you know the Rosaria Respect glitch. In the description, I'm also going to add a link to Souls Planner and Mugen Monkey. So I use some of these links in order to kind of refine my build in a very specific way. I use Souls Planner to get perfect armor, and I use Mugen Monkey to quickly compare the damage rates between different weapons. So I'm adding links to both of those in the description. Kind of the last thing I'll talk about is just the soft cap and the hard cap when it comes to making your build. The soft cap returns to the point of diminishing returns, where if you put a point in, you're not really getting a good enough amount of points back. Well, all of the attributes in this game have a soft cap, right? You can take your strength up to like 40, and then after 40, you're not getting very good returns, but some people take it all the way up to 66, right? And 66 is where you run into something called the hard cap. If you keep putting points in, you get 
basically nothing out. So you never want to go up to the, you know, you never want to pass the hard cap, is what I'm trying to say. And as for the soft cap, you generally do want to reach the soft cap because all the damage leading up to the soft cap is very efficient. Okay, so that's soft cap, hard cap. The other thing I can mention is just you need to pay attention to your rings. Some rings are really more valuable than others, such as the prisoner's chain is very valuable. Uh, and it, it, the rings are kind of, you know, I think I should probably make a whole separate topic just for rings because there's so much information to go over when it comes to rings. But uh, in general, when it comes to invading, uh, there's a few rings that really stand out. Probably the silver cat ring, which allows you to drop far distances without taking any damage. You can use that to bait the host, essentially. The other ring is probably the untrue dark ring, which you use to look fancier while you're invading. I know that doesn't sound important, but if invading wasn't fun, nobody would do it. So the untrue dark ring, you know, you can look up how to get it. You can have a friend duplicate it for you or just give you one if you don't have one. Uh, basically, you put it on and you don't glow red or purple anymore, which is really nice. So I always bring the untrue dark ring at this point. It's just, it's a fashion thing, right? <laughs> As for knowing which weapon you should bring into the invasion, I should say that invasions are really defined by asymmetric gameplay, where you typically, you know, the worst case scenario is you have to fight a whole group of enemies. They're gonna have a lot more Estus than you. They're gonna protect each other. They're gonna, you're gonna have to deal with them swinging at the same time, which means it's very hard to punish them, right? And what you're gonna have to do in those situations, you're gonna have to bait the opponent, and you're gonna have to try and use moves that one-shot them. That might be like parrying them. That might be getting a drop attack on them. Or, or you know, having the AI help you, pulling them into the AI. If there really is a group of three or four people and you can delay the fight long enough, very often another invader will help you out. You just have to be careful with that other invader because you get friendly fire and the other invader can actually decide to kill you. So just be careful about that, okay? Okay, we've talked about deciding what level you want to invade at. We've talked about making sure your build is efficient and that you bring an appropriate weapon. Really, the last topic in the pregame is having the right equipment. Equipment plays a role. So the truth is I could probably go on for a while just talking about equipment for invasions. But what I'm really going to do is focus on the equipment that makes the largest impact. And I'm sure as you invade, you'll discover more of the other ones. So this is really about the most important equipment that every invader really should have. Let's get started by talking about an easy item, the, the red eye orbs, right? You have the cracked red eye orb and the red eye orb. The difference between the two is that the red eye orb is not a consumable. You can use it as many times as you want. You get it by completing the quest of Leonhardt. And then the other one is the cracked red eye orb, and this is a consumable. Basically, you can farm a bunch of these, and what it does is it prioritizes group fights. So if you like to be in a group fight, I enjoy being in group fights, you might farm up a few of these before you get started, okay? Next, we're going to talk about Estus versus Ashen Estus. Basically, what you want to do is you want to bring as much Estus as possible, but you probably also want to bring some Ashen Estus so that you can use your weapon art. Also, you use Ashen Estus to apply a useful miracle called Tears of Denial, which you generally do want to have Tears of Denial on your build if you can afford it. And uh, yeah, so I always bring about one Ashen Estus with me, maybe two Ashen Estus, and that way I can proc Tears of Denial again if it breaks. Now, when it comes to other consumables, there's a few that really stand out. The very first one, of course, is gonna be the Undead Hunter Charm. When you throw an Undead Hunter Charm, it, you know, puff of white smoke comes out and anybody on the enemy team who is standing in the puff of white smoke isn't going to be allowed to use their Estus for a little while. These guys are a little expensive, but it's worth buying them. Yeah, I don't spam them when I invade. I actually rely more on just one-shotting or totally outplaying my opponent. But some people, when they do invade, they actually use all of these right away, right? You get five of them per invasion, use them at the right time, so that the host and his buddies cannot heal and then you just pressure the host and his buddies really hard while they can't heal, right? So uh, again, I don't rely on them too much, but they're extremely valuable, especially if you knock your opponent over, right? If you have a move that gives you a knockdown or you get a backstab or a repost, you're going to be able to throw an undead hunter charm while they're trying to recover. And of course, instead of throwing the charm, you could attack them while they try to recover. It's just up to you. 
Next, I want to mention the green blossom. What you do with the green blossom is when the host is going to run all the way back to the bonfire in order to summon somebody or just to get away from you, you eat a green blossom. And when the two of you have run out of stamina, your stamina is actually going to regenerate faster than his. So you're going to wait for it to regen to full and then you're going to chase him again and you're eventually going to catch up to him if he didn't also eat a green blossom. So it's a chasing item. And when you do catch up to the opponent, you can start to punish him and uh, you know, he'll have to start rolling, which costs stamina, and it's not as fast as running. So yeah, that's actually pretty important for chasing, the green blossom is. I guess I should mention Divine Blessing and Sigbrow. Uh, those two items will give you your health back, they're consumable, but honestly, it, there's no easy way to farm these, so I wouldn't rely on them. I never use them, I actually just give them away as gifts. So yeah, well, I'll just give them a quick mention. Finally, let's talk about throwing knives and the bombs, right? So you have the Guardian Shiv, you have throwing knives, and you have the Kukri, I believe they're pronounced, right? You can use all of these as ranged attacks. Keep in mind that the Guardian Shiv will use your FP, so you have to consider that, right? But the Guardian Shivs are really good if you break somebody else's Tears of Denial, and then you immediately throw a Shiv, you're able to basically kill them before they can regen too much health, if they even have regen. So I always have the Guardian Shivs with me. Um, throwing knives are okay, I just, they just don't do enough damage for me to worry too much about them. Same with the Kukri, they don't really do enough damage. But, talking about the bombs, the fire bombs actually start to do a decent amount of damage. They also can hit people in a whole group. So, if you have the money to afford them, you can bring with you the black fire bomb, regular fire bomb, which you can carry 20 fire bombs, which is a lot, and the lightning urn, which is basically a fire bomb, right? But it, it's lightning, uh, and that scales off of, you know, uh, faith. So you can use that on dark builds or on cleric builds. And the lightning urns are terrific. They're just, you can only access them if you did the complete gray rat quest line. A lot of people haven't done that. I highly recommend being able to access lightning urns, right? Because they are terrific, okay? So you can use all of those as projectiles, which is really great for harassing your opponent. I want to give also an honorable mention to the rope fire bombs, which if you've ever had trouble with somebody on a ladder, I believe the rope fire bombs can give them trouble. I, I'm trying to remember, I think I did have a situation where I had somebody who was trying to stall on a ladder, and all I did was turn, you know, I faced my butt toward them, and dropped fire bombs down the ladder and it actually hit them. I, I can't tell you if that'll work every time because I think the fire bombs continue to fall at an angle, I'm not sure, but if they don't fall at an angle or you're able to get an angle that works on your, you know, maybe you're able to stand to the side and angle it a different way uh, at the person on the ladder, I, I would fire bomb them. I would try at least. Just uh, don't be baited anyways into climbing onto a ladder if you got somebody who's there trying to patiently wait you out on the ladder. If you ever get somebody who's on a ladder and he's trying to bait you out, just ignore him and play the game. Just ignore him, go to the boss and walk through the boss fog wall. He you know, he'll be sent home if you do that. You don't ever have to, you don't ever have to challenge somebody on a ladder. Since we're talking about throwing knives, we're talking about fire bombs, I might as well mention crossbows as well. Just be careful if you bring a crossbow not to over level it, obviously. But yeah, crossbows are a terrific way to get damage on your opponent. The bolts usually do a lot more damage than a throwing knife. You have exploding bolts, by the way, which allow you to hit the group. If somebody's blocking, but his buddy's standing next to him, his buddy gets hit too, right? And his buddy might not be blocking. So, yeah, your crossbows are really terrific. Uh, they, they use bolts rather than FP, so you can save on your FP, right? You know, you could be using, like, a sorcery, but sorcery is going to use all of your Ash and Estus. Crossbows don't use any Ash and Estus, so you really can spam them. Next, we're going to talk about health regen. So when you're all out of Estus, health regen becomes a really convenient way for you to stay in the fight. It takes a while, but you're going to use it to, you know, get back to full health, engage the group, engage the host again. And then if you get hurt real bad, you run away and you health regen again. There's a few items that are really important to know about. The first one is probably the Sun Princess Ring. So this is one of the infamous rings that everybody uses in duels and you can use it here in invasions as well you equip it and it gives you like a tick of health per time right and one of the things you can do to get that to go faster is you unequip it and re-equip it as fast as you can so like you'll just spam the on off button really quickly and every time you put the ring on you get a tick of health uh, another item you can think about is either like a blessed item that you brought with you like a blessed cestus or the oak shield. So in one hand you can have the oak shield, in the other one you can have the blessed cestus, then you can have the sun princess ring on, and you can be spamming that ring on and off as fast as you can, and that'll get your health regen up pretty quickly. 
The other option, if you have plenty of FP left, is to put a priest chime in either of your hands. So you'll want to buy two priest chimes, right? And I say priest chime just because you can use a priest chime at rank 10 faith. So when you're doing your build, you probably should have 10, 10 faith at least. Uh, really, you should have 15 so that you can bring tears of denial. But anyways, yeah, so if you have FP left, put a chime in each hand, activate the weapon art in each hand, and you will have a ton of health regen. So the priest chime is just kind of a faster way to do that rather than you know, doing the other method that I talked about, the Cestus, Oak Shield, and Princess Ring. Yeah, those you do those if you don't want to spend FP. You do the Priest Chime if you want to go faster, but you do want to spend FP. And that's going to tell you everything you need to know about health. I'm ready for you now, Brad. Isn't that obvious? You know, if you've got a situation where you don't need your offhand for some reason, you can just have the blessed Cestus in your offhand at all times, and invasions can take a long time, so you're going to get it health regen for the entire length of the uh, invasion, right? So the a little bit of health regen, you can go a long way. And besides that, just having a Cestus in your offhand is never too bad of an idea, because if you get a hard read on your opponent, you know that you can parry him, you can bring out that Cestus and get a little parry out, right? So yeah, not a bad idea, right? Finally, we're going to talk about the Black Separation Crystal. This is an item that allows you to go home. It's very convenient, like if you've run out of time to invade, you've got to get off of your game. You use the Black Separation Crystal rather than dying. Uh, some other situations is uh, if you want to be nice to the host, right? You don't want to kill him, you feel bad for him. You, bla you Maybe you killed his group off, right? And he's the last one, but you don't want to be mean to him. So you use Black Separation Crystal and get out of there. I, I do that all the time, actually. In fact, if I invade just one host, and it's really obvious he doesn't understand PvP very well. I drop him a number and I leave, right? So Black Separation Crystal is fun for that. And then there's very legitimate reasons to use it where uh, here's another one of my favorite times to use the Black Separation Crystal. Let's say I'm at risk, real risk, of losing in an area where I would really prefer not to have to run to, right? Because when you're the invader and you die, Wherever it is you died, you're going to have to go all the way over there and retrieve your souls, right? Well, if I'm in a situation where I'm about to die, I've got no more Estes, and I know I have time for the separation crystal, right? I keep it on my toolbar so I can access it very quickly. I just get out of there because I honestly don't want to have to run and collect my souls. And then here's even another one. Sometimes there's parts of the map that you have locked off in your world that the host has unlocked in his world and he wants to fight you in that area well it's not always a good idea to fight in that area because if he actually defeats you you're not going to be able to retrieve your souls when you go back to your game so if you're in a situation where you're in one of those locked off areas but it's unlocked in the host's world that's a good time to just leave the fight you don't want to die there it's not worth it it's going to be very annoying if you lose sometimes when i'm invading i'm holding on to like 500,000 to a million to two million souls. And when I die and fail to retrieve those souls, it's pretty annoying because I could have used them to buy a whole bunch of equipment that would help me do more invading, right? So you you know, you wanna, you wanna make sure that you hold on to those souls so you can buy more undead hunter charms, more green blossoms, more of everything like the lightning urns, arrows. So you don't wanna lose your souls as the invader uh, and, and the black crystal helps you make smart decisions about that, okay? The last thing is if you really are fighting a very competent gank squad and you know you've done a nice chunk of damage to them but it's unlikely that you're gonna finish them off, that is another nice time to black crystal out of there because you're doing the next invader a uh, favor really. You know, if they kill you, everybody in that gank squad is gonna get an Estus back. But if you black crystal out, then you've effectively done a chunk of damage to them, you've left, and you know, the next invader doesn't have to deal with as many Estus on the enemy team. Does that make sense? So let's say you've caused the enemy team to have to use like six or ten of their Estus, but it's obvious that you've now run out, you know, like a like an attrition thing, right? Like they've outlasted you. Instead of dying and giving them back four Estus, just Black Crystal out of there. You might even be the one who gets summoned back in there next. So you're really doing yourself a favor if you do that. But really, if you're not summoned back in, you at least know you're helping the next invader. And that's what it's all about when you're fighting the gang squad, right?
All right, and that's going to wrap up the pregame advice I have for you. It's all about deciding what level you want to invade at, making sure you don't overlevel your weapon, getting an efficient build, using the appropriate weapons, you know, strong weapons, because it's going to be difficult for you. It's always difficult for the invader. And finally, thinking about your equipment before you're entering those fights, right? You want to make sure you have all the equipment on you that you might need. Next, we talk about the mid game. This is the part where we are invading the host, but we're not quite fighting him yet, right? We're not talking about combat strategies. So the first thing that you're actually going to do is check the bonfire to see where all the action is at. If you scroll across all of the bonfires to see the activity, you'll notice they have a little symbol on the left that shows you how active it is. I, I don't know how to describe it. I guess that looks kind of like a, a dark soul or something like that, right? And uh, the number of those, three represents that there's a lot of people, two represents that there's kind of a lot of people, and if there's nothing there, it's not very active. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't try to invade there, because guess what? I try to invade inactive areas all the time, and almost always get invaded. Like one of my favorite places is the Irithyll Dungeon. I love invading Irithyll Dungeon. And I, you know, it very rarely says that there's activity there, but it's, it's lying, it's fucking lying to me because I go there and I always get an invasion. So don't let the symbol discourage you from trying different places. Just go wherever it is that you want to go. So really, where should you go? Well, if you're new to invasions, you need to go to a map where you can memorize the map. That's really important, okay? Uh, for me, I, as I mentioned before, I invade at the dual meta level, which means a lot of the people who I run into are around the boss locations, as well as the two DLCs, Ashes of Ariandel and the Ring City. So I do a lot of invading in the two DLC areas just because they're very active at my soul level. And I've come to really memorize those maps. You'd be surprised. You know, when you're playing the campaign as a host, you don't really pay that much attention to every nook and cranny of the map. When you're an invader, that is exactly what you need to do. You need to have everything memorized in that map. So again, if you're new, if you're starting invasions, that's what I recommend. Pick an area and memorize the heck out of it. And that kind of moves us on to the next subject of the mid game, uh, finding the host, right? So this is a big deal. You are tracking the host down and that is something you do not learn from duels, right? When I was doing only duels and I jumped into invasions, I found that was one of the biggest barriers to being an invader is you actually have to find the host, right? There was all sorts of other barriers like learning to deal with Estus, learning to deal with somebody who doesn't want to fight you, right? All kinds of problems. But the most difficult part of transitioning from duels to invasions is spawning in the host's world and realizing you don't know where the host is, right? The game actually places you pretty far away from the host, and I think it does that to, to allow the host to become prepared, but also I think it does that because it adds to the experience for the host and the invader of, of sabotaging each other, right? So this is actually a really critical part of invading, the fact that you're so far away from the host when you invade. Now, as you're invading, the host gets a warning sign. You've been invaded by, you know, Mr. Butt Cheek Face, right? He gets that warning sign, but even before that, if he's an experienced player, he will check his uh, coiled sword fragment as well as his uh, bones, right, to see if he can teleport home. And if he can't, he knows he's been invaded. You can also use your soap stone signs to decide if you've been invaded as well. Th those will no longer be usable. So the host can actually know pretty far ahead of time if he's been invaded. And for the invader, this is a really critical moment because as you're spawning into the world, you're probably applied Tears of Denial at that point. But what you're going to be doing is using the clues around you, like your Sherlock Holmes, to discover where the host has been and therefore where he must be. Now what you're trying to figure out is has the host passed up your spawning point and he's on his way to the next bonfire? Or did he backtrack to the previous bonfire because he wanted to, I don't know, summon a friend? Or he just wants to die near the previous bonfire if he loses, right? That's reasonable. A lot of hosts don't like to lose their souls, right? So, the first thing I do, of course, is I progress forward in the map, or I use my eyes, right? I just check. I, I turn my camera and I check to see what enemies have been disturbed. Uh, if, obviously, if they're dead, they've been disturbed, right? <laughs> but... The other thing you need to look for is just have they moved from their original point. You see, all the AI, they're kind of like uh, they're kind of like trip wires, right? They're kind of like alarms. If they're standing there the way they're meant to stand there when they haven't been disturbed, you know the host has never been there. 
but if now they're like patrolling or they've moved from their original spot, you know he's been there, right? And so there's all kinds of things that you have to check for to see the progression of the host. Some other things to check for, of course, is to see if the host has unlocked certain shortcuts. And you, uh, let me say, you really have to have a trained eye for that because sometimes when the shortcuts have been unlocked, it's a sign that the host has returned to this area because he's going to be doing some backtracking. It, it gets kind of complicated. In short, tracking the host is a unique skill to invasions and it's something you'll definitely learn by invading the same area over and over again. You'll learn to you'll learn to recognize why the game is spawning you in a particular area, right? Like if it spawns you on top of a tall bridge, it is usually a sign that the host has made a certain kind of progress. Like if you're invading the inner wall at the Ring City and you're you're placed on top of a tall bridge and you can see that the enemies for the inner wall bonfire haven't been disturbed, it actually might be that you've been placed into an invasion that deals with the city streets and the host is actually backtracking up on the tall bridges to get to the purging stone, right? And so you could have invaded from inner wall, but in truth, this is actually a city streets invasion. So it gets kind of complicated, and like I said, is all about memorizing these areas. Okay, so let's assume that you've successfully tracked the host. You know where he has to be based on your observation of the areas. Next, you're going to want to engage the host, and the question you have to have is, can I sabotage him or will I be sabotaged? That's really important, okay? So as you're approaching where you think the host is, you need to start looking really carefully at the cor you know, at doorways and corners that you're approaching. Sometimes what I like to do is as I'm approaching a doorway, I like to actually dip backwards. Like I walk toward it as if I'm going to walk through the doorway, but then I dip backwards because, well, obviously the host is expecting you, and what he's doing is he's standing at that doorway waiting to get a charged R2 off on you. And this is basically going to be him getting like a free drop attack, right? That kind of deal. And in another situation, you could be the one doing that, right? You could have found the host and you're standing behind the doorway and he doesn't know you're there yet. And what you can do is charge an R2 as he approaches and hit him in the face with that R2 as he walks through the doorway. And obviously, if you spawned on the high ground, you could also get a drop attack on your opponent, okay? So looking for those situations is really a nice way to start your fights or to avoid a nasty start to your fight. The next thing you have to consider is that the host could be hiding, and this is really important and really it goes back to tracking. Once again, the host could be using, you know, chameleon or white tree branch. They rarely use chameleon, it's almost a white tree branch, and they are hiding in the world. Well, an opponent who is hiding will turn into an object that fits into the world, uh, but is not quite right. The first thing that gives it away is any auras that the host is using will actually still glow. The next thing is that your host's fake item will be slightly lighter than the items that it should be like, right? So, oh man, this is, <laughs> hiding could almost be its own uh, separate video. It's kind of a big, big topic. Uh, but hosts do love to hide, uh, especially if they want to try and time you out, right? They're thinking to themselves, I'll just hide and he won't ever find me and he'll give up. And you know what? Sometimes that's effective. Not very often. Depends on what map you're on. Like, oh man, one of the worst ones to try and find a host on is definitely like Crucifixion Woods and Fair and Keep, just because you have the two areas that are separated. And the Fair and Keep can actually be really large, so it can be hard to get around fair and keep without the host being able to do something that's really tricky. So in general, when it comes to hiding, it's very hard for the host to hide on an extremely linear map. Because what the invader can do is go room by room, by hallway, by whatever, and just investigate it entirely, and then progress forward, and eventually you're gonna find the host. There's no way for the host to keep hiding. And uh, in my opinion, inner wall and city streets kind of are like that. Although city streets is kind of more difficult. But if you're in an area like Fair and Keep and Crucifixion Woods, right, that I'm just going to use as an example again, the host can actually hide really well, see where you're going, and then after you've ran past him, he actually backtracks to a new area, and he just keeps doing this. And in a sense, he just stays hidden forever. You're never able to completely scan the whole area because the host has the advantage of being able to move around. 
So this is really irritating. Another thing that the host can do is he can use an emote to make his body crouched and smaller. And so sometimes they won't turn into an object at all. They just pick a corner and they crouch in it, right? And I, that doesn't really work on me too often. Uh, I think that it does work more often when they're using like a white branch and they've turned into an object. That definitely worked on me when I first started invading as well. These days, it's very hard to hide from me in particular because I've done so many invasions, but it, especially in the really big white areas, it's not impossible to waste my time hiding. For example, I, I mentioned city streets. Well, city streets is kind of a big wide area too, right? And the host can turn into a purple rock. I think that the purple rock is the best disguise. So if he has a lot of white branches on hand, he can keep using them until he turns into a purple rock. And then he can just, you know, crouch in with all the purple rocks in that area. And I'd have to check them all in order to find them because he only looks a little bit different than the other rocks, especially if I'm looking from a distance, right? So finding a host who's trying to play hide and seek with you, you know, he's trying to play cat and mouse, can actually make you waste a ton of time. And you have to make a decision if you want to punish him for trying to hide from you, which means really you can find him eventually. I mean, it'll be difficult, but you can eventually find him. Or you can just black crystal out right away. You can be like, the host is hiding, he wins, I just gotta get out of here and move on to my next invasion. It's up to you. It's up to you based on how much time you want. You know, if you're new to an area, sometimes it's a good idea to spend a lot of time trying to find a hiding host because it familiarizes you with the area in the first place, which is great practice. And at the same time, you get practice playing hide and seek with a very cowardly host. My next tip is going to be telling you to be wary of traps. Sometimes the host actually exposes himself to you. Not that kind of exposure, guys. But you know what I mean. He shows up in the doorway and he's like, hey, follow me. Uh, you know, I, you can kill me. I'm all by myself. He's not all by himself. What he's going to do is going to lead you into a small room or he's going to lead you under a ledge and his buddy is going to trap you or drop on you. And sometimes it's not just his buddy, sometimes it's four people, sometimes it's a full gang squad. So once again, I'm going to warn you, anytime you walk through a doorway, anytime you're following a host at the very beginning of an invasion, you have to be keenly aware of your surroundings. You know, his buddies could be doing all kinds of tricks to be hiding as he lures you in. They could be laying down and you can only see their feet because they've laid down in a corner so that their torso goes through the wall they could be using crouch they could be hidden as a fake object which usually that one's a little easier to detect or they could just be hiding behind the other side of the doorway all of those are legit strategies to trap the invader and it's up to the invader to proceed with the utmost caution and on the flip side, you could be setting up traps of your own. You know, invasions allow a lot more creativity than duels, where you can you know, put down like, oh, I don't know, like embers, a, ho a whole bunch of them, right? You set them down one at a time, and the host starts picking them up, and then you shoot them off of a bridge with your great bow, something like that, right? So as the invader, if you're trying to meme on your opponent, if you're trying to troll them, you can do, you know, funny little traps, usually by dropping an item, or just by remaining hidden in an appropriate area that you know the host is about to proceed to, the other thing, of course, is if you're very fast at tracking your opponent and you know you're going to have the high ground, I have the high ground, don't try, right? Uh, you know you're going to have the high ground, uh, get to that area that you know you're going to be able to jump off of them and get that jump attack. Really, really fun. Uh, it doesn't happen too often, but every now and then the stars align and you're given an amazing drop attack from a high distance, right? So setting traps really is supposed to be part of invading if you love to set traps. I'm not that kind of guy. I'm not a traps kind of guy. You know, I've been dueling for so long. I'm really more like rush straight to the host and kill him as fast as I can. That's me. <laughs> and that's going to be most of the mid game. The mid game is all about deciding where you want to invade, make sure that you memorize the map, and of course, learn to track your opponent by looking for what's been disturbed, what's out of place, right? And understanding really complex invasions where maybe you're actually invading an area that has to do with the next bonfire rather than the bonfire that you invaded from, okay? I think we're going to wrap up there and head on to the end game. All right, now we're going to move on to this thing that I'm calling the end game. You've made your build, you've tracked the host down, and you're fighting him at this point. This is kind of a wide discussion, just like the other things we talked about. You know, there's a lot of things we could say. This guide could probably go on for another hour at least, but I'm going to try and hit the important parts for you so that you get the information you need to be an effective invader. The best mindset for approaching an invasion is to assume the worst. Assume that the host 
is a competent player, assume he's got friends with him, there's blues on the way, and you're all by yourself with five Estes, and they're gonna have like 25 Estes, right? It's gonna be it's gonna be a very asymmetric group fight where they have a strong advantage over you. If you go into every one of your invasions with that mindset, I guarantee you will win a lot more of your invasion because you're not gonna take the host or anyone else in the match for granted. The number one priority in your playstyle has to be patience. You have to look for opportunities to be effective without taking any damage. That's the truth. If you just run in there and you, you, you know, you swing at them and you swing at them, they're gonna overwhelm you. That's how it plays out. Uh, you know, you might get a little bit of damage in there. You might get some dents in there. You might kill, hey, you might even kill like one white phantom, right? It doesn't matter. What matters is if you killed the host and you can only do that in the right circumstances. The host has to make a mistake essentially, right? Uh, and if he's a clever host, he really won't be trying to make a mistake. He will be avoiding that like play. Now, a lot of the time you aren't necessarily going to be invading a gank squad, but if you are, let me just mention that if you are patient enough, another invader eventually will show up. So again, patience is a virtue here. If you want to win against this gank squad, give yourself a chance to get help from another invader. And when he does show up, you have to be very careful around him so that you don't deal friendly fire. The other thing you want to do is make sure that he isn't necessarily your leader, right? If he just barges right in because he's a terrible invader, you want to make sure you don't follow him to your doom because then the gang squad's going to get to point him down and point you down too because you're dumb. It's kind of like when you're driving, you know, and somebody speeds past you at 80 miles an hour and you're like, hey, I'm going to drive that fast too, right? Don't do it. You're going to get a ticket in the end. It's just like that. You're going to get a ticket. You know, you're going to get pulled over if you follow him to his doom, right? Now, ultimately, the reason why patience is so valuable, asked the invader, is because in a group of four people, they tend to be overconfident. Even in a group of two people, the host and his buddy can get overconfident. You know, the, uh, the people who have been summoned have nothing to lose. When they die, they don't drop their souls. So a lot of the times, you can just play off of their impatience and wait for them to abandon the host. Then you can either fight the host by himself, or you can kill the summon, right? Either one of those. But splitting the enemy group off is the most consistent way to win your invasions. Almost the only way to win an invasion against a competent group, right? If you duel a group of competent people, well, you break it down into 1v1 duels, you might win. But if you try to duel three competent duelists at the same time, you will almost definitely lose. Okay, so I've covered the value of being patient against a squad and the importance of dividing them, of getting them to split up. Let's move on to the next thing you need to do in your combat. So now that we've talked about splitting the enemy group up, suppose you are fighting somebody 1v1. What is it that you're looking for? You're looking to two-shot that guy. No matter what you do, if you can two-shot him, you can get rid of him. And you can risk taking some damage doing that because you're going to get an Estus back, right? But if you can two-shot him, you're going to kill him before he rolls away and heals up. Okay, really, really important. That could even mean parrying him. And it's funny because in duels, Pairing is not considered very high tier. Pairing is considered too risky and too readable. But in an invasion, you can just run away forever. And this really baits your opponent. And you can just take as much time as you need to get your opponent to become more readable and more baited, more impatient, right? And a good parry can lead to your opponent's death in one move, maybe two moves. But it's critical to be able to get something like a drop attack, a good two shot on your opponent, or a parry. That is one of the most consistent ways to kill people during an invasion when you're fighting a group. Get them to split up, two shot them, drop attack, or parry. Those three things. But then you run into groups who are even too good to be split up. Sometimes groups are so clever that they know the moment they split up, that you have an advantage. And so they make a rule in their head, like a mindset, right? That they're never going to abandon the host. They're gonna to stick together, butt buddies, right? They're gonna to stick together the whole time. And you'll figure that out over time. You'll really begin to realize these guys aren't splitting up. If they fight the AI at all, they're gonna do so extremely carefully and they're gonna do so with projectiles rather than putting themselves into danger. You see, these are guys who are patient too. And so you really do have to fight them as a group. I find these groups to be a lot of fun because they're also where I get my favorite footage from, right? These are the guys who stick by the bonfire, whatever it is they do, they're very careful, and it's so fun to smash them and just be like, 
you can be as careful as you want. I'm still going to win, right? So let me talk a little bit about how to fight these guys. At this point, we're talking about kind of more abstract ideas. You kind of have to visualize what I'm talking about, and they apply to moments that could pass like instantly, very quickly. But basically, you're going to approach the group, and the trick here is to kind of understand who's closest to you and to always keep somebody in your range but the other people out of your range. So somebody in the group is always closest to you and whoever that is needs to be just at the end of your weapon. Does that make sense? So you're not allowing yourself to be in the range of multiple people at the same time even if you are fighting them as a group. This is critical. I think some people do this automatically like it's a gut feeling, don't get too close to the group. But the thing is you got to look out for the guy who wants to surround you. One person in the group, sometimes two people, they look at you and they go, I've got to surround this guy. They're waiting for you to attack or they're waiting to catch you off guard. And what they're going to do is they're going to try and run forward and get behind you. The moment that happens, you have to roll and you have to start running. No exceptions. Never, never let these guys surround you. You must always keep them on one side of you. Like I said before, the moment you are surrounded, it is game over for you. Always keep the group on one side and always keep only one person within the range of your weapon. Now, as you're exchanging back and forth with just the end of your weapon, you usually run into a situation where you're finally ready to net a kill. The first thing I have to say is if he's rolling away, your opponent is rolling away almost dead, you have to still be patient. He might roll back and heal up, you just have to accept it. But if you're skilled at this, if you've been doing this for a while, you'll recognize when you have the stamina needed to get that kill, when his opponents don't have the stamina needed to defend him, and you will just charge straight into the group to try and take one more shot to kill your opponent, right? That is a, it's a very scary moment. It's a moment that could end the invasion for you if you're not really good at reading your opponents. You just charge right in to get that last hit. And if you get it, He's out of the group now. The group has just become that much easier. And once you've killed him, you have to be ready to, again, get the group on one side of you, okay? So you run in, get one shot on him, and then you need to roll, roll, roll to safety. And a lot of that, being able to roll to safety, a lot of that is being able to unlock from your opponent, okay? So I haven't talked about that up till now, but playing unlocked is critical for invasions because if you're allowing the game to jump between people that you're locked onto, you will aim your shots wrong. You will also roll away from the group incorrectly. Instead of rolling backwards as far as you can away from the group, you'll accidentally strafe the group, right? You'll roll to the left or the right of them, allowing them to quickly catch up and surround you. So playing unlocked, you need to lock on for that last shot, then you need to immediately lock off and you need to roll to safety. A, a, a lot of this is being able to play, like, mm, you know, a lot of shooter games, you need to know how to back up while you're shooting without running into a corner. It's the same exact deal here. You need to be able to back up without being able to see what's behind you. You just have to have it memorized and you have to unlock and roll into those areas perfectly. It all takes a lot of practice, just like being, you know, effective with your weapon takes practice. So, uh, you know, when it comes to that, all I can say is practice that. But I, I've told you how to engage the group now. You keep them on one side. You keep the guy who's furthest out of the group in range of your weapon, but everyone else needs to stay out of your weapon. And if they're all trying to crowd you at the same time, you need to know when you're in danger and you need to run for it. Another very scary moment that you can actually pull off is if you can manage to parry somebody who's inside of the group and go into the repost. If you go into the repost, you're unkillable. Your opponent can't hit you. And this is a <laughs> this ends up being really valuable if you parried somebody and you know you're going to get the kill during the repost. So you, you parry, you get the repost, and then you better be clicking that roll button like crazy because they are going to be... All of them are going to be swinging into you, trying to catch you at the end of the repost. They might actually catch you, but in my opinion, it's usually worth it because you secured that kill. Uh, and then, yeah, so uh, parries, if you're just very good at parrying, that's another thing. It just takes a lot of practice to be skilled with parrying or guard breaking. You know, if you guard broke the opponent, you can step into the group to get that repost. And again, you're going to be perfectly safe while you're getting the kill. Now, getting further into the issue of killing the host, you run into situations where the host is incredibly cheesy. The host will have regen spells, he'll have regen shield. We're talking about like gank squad hosts. 
they will have weapons like the Ring Knight Ultra Great Sword. They will have the Farron Great Sword. These are weapons that are meant to be able to catch you off guard from a long distance, but they're able to protect each other. So you're not really able to punish the weakness of those weapons, right? So these gang squad hosts are real cowards. They understand everything that you're weak against. They understand all of their weaknesses. And what they're generally going to do is they're generally going to just hang at the back of the group and they're going to wait for you to die. And if they're ever in trouble, they're going to dash, right? They are not going to fight you at all. They're going to spam their roll and they're going to drink their, they're going to be chugging Estus the whole time. It's very hard to kill these guys. One of the problems you run into is rather than fight you with their teammates that they've already summoned in, if one of their teammates dies, they're just going to summon in more people. And there's a, there's actually a cooldown timer for that. But one of the things that they can do to avoid the cooldown timer is if they're using like blue sentinels or if they're using dark moon blades, they'll unequip the covenant item and then they'll re-equip the covenant item, you know, the way of blue, and this resets the timer. So they can just keep bringing in blues and eventually if you don't kill all of his summons in time, which if there's like three of them left, it's gonna take you too long anyways. You know, if it's taking you too long, he's gonna get his buddy back in. So these guys, you know, honestly, they're almost impossible to kill on your own. Your, your best strategy is to wait until another red invades, make sure he's friendly, make sure he isn't gonna stab you in the back. Speaking of which, if you're wearing the untrue dark ring like I am, really bad invaders don't realize what the untrue dark ring is and they might attack you. So if another invader comes into the match, sometimes it's a good idea to just go ahead and remove that untrue dark ring so he knows who you are. And then once it's the two of you versus the four of them, you really do at that point have a chance of succeeding. You have to play off of each other, but basically once the host loses one of his players, it's gonna be a 3v2. And honestly, oh, those gang squad guys are rarely that good. And the smaller their group gets, the easier they are to kill. And every time you kill them, you get one of your Estes back. So sometimes you just gotta be patient against those big gang squads and you gotta wait for another guy to come and back you up. A lot of invaders are very skilled, you know, it's very cool to get somebody else who's really skilled at the game come into your world and just smash the hell out of those gang squads and that's what they deserve. All of them deserve to be smashed, right? Well, I don't know. I just, gang squads keep the game alive too, by the way. Uh, if you only invaded hosts, Eventually, everybody will have finished the campaign. Everybody in the universe will have finished the campaign, and the game will officially be dead. So I don't hate gang squads. They keep the game alive. They give invaders something to do. Now, to kind of wrap things up for this last part, the end game, I want to mention a few things I talked about in the previous sections that maybe you didn't listen to because you used the timestamps. I want to mention Black Crystal is actually really useful. If you've been fighting a gang squad and doing a terrific job, you remove like 10 of their Estus, you can use the Black Crystal when you're about to die and get out of there. That way the gang squad doesn't get any more Estus back. And then there's a fairly good chance you'll actually reinvade them when you try to invade your next person. The other reasons why you might use Black Crystal is if you're worried that the host wants to fight you in an area that you don't have unlocked in your world, you don't want to do that because if he kills you in that room or whatever he's in, you're not going to be able to retrieve your souls when you get back to your world. So in my opinion, it's smarter for you to just move on and not risk being punished really badly in the invasion. For me, if I ever lose my souls trying to pick them up, it's usually 500,000 to about 2 million souls that I lose. And I use those souls to buy equipment, so I don't like to lose them ever. Finally, you can use the Black Crystal to be nice to the host, right? You can go in, kill all of his goofy summons, you know, throw a dung pie at him and Black Crystal out without ruining his day, and he will have had a fun little PvP exchange without having to feel too bad about the ending. And when you are an invasion god, right, you're the parry king, when you've come that far, you really can't afford to leave embers to whoever you want. You'll probably have a plenty of embers in inventory. I've got like... I, I'm, I'm full on embers, and I just give them away, right? Give out 10, give out 5, and what this does is it means that the host is more likely to be embered again, which just means that there's more people to invade, right? So be generous. Give those embers out. You don't need, you know, you don't need 600 embers for anything. So yeah, be generous with the host. Sometimes another thing I do when I've been farming for something that's pretty rare, I like to take any duplicates I have and give them to the host as well. I think that's a little fun thing to do. And maybe that's where I should end things, having fun. You know, uh, I think that this is a game of frustration. I've heard that Dark Souls 3 is voted the most toxic community. I don't think that the community is necessarily toxic. I think it's a, a very, very frustrating game. And that elicits emotions out of us that makes us want to, you know, 
throttle each other's necks, right? Well, that's how the host might feel and is a, is a genuine Dark Souls experience, right? It's that toxic experience, but it can also be a little bit of fun. You can go in there. Uh, I, I had an invasion a while back where I actually messaged the host and ended up helping the host finish the map that they were on just for fun. You know, I was pointing out where the rare items were and all that kind of stuff. So have some fun with it. Leave the host a present. If you lose and they point down, don't take it too personally. And with that being said, I hope you guys enjoyed this guide. If you did, let me know. I did have to work pretty hard on it. It's a pretty long guide. So if you want to show your appreciation, you can leave me a like, you can leave me a comment. I would really appreciate that. I hope to see you guys next time. Just want to thank y'all so much! Ooh.